Hello everyone, this is Brisson Gradato, Project Coordinator of Educational Services for the Association of Community Cancer Centers. I want to thank you for joining us for the webinar entitled Developing a Culture of Nutrition at a Community Cancer Center. This webinar is supported by Abbott Oncology. Today's webinar series has been designed to provide practical information to help community-based cancer programs develop and enhance cancer nutrition pro services. Please note that this webinar will be archived online for your reference and to share with your colleagues. I want to provide you with a quick review of the webinar tools for today's session. You will notice on your screen that there is an Ask a Question text box located on the lower left corner. This is where you are asked to speak a question. Please type your question in the box and hit the Submit button. Your questions will only be seen by the speaker. This will allow you to ask questions throughout the presentation and at the end of the session we will also leave time for a Q&A. If you would like to download a PDF version of today's presentation, you can do so by clicking on the drop-down menu located in the upper left corner of the page. I would also like to mention that after the webinar, we'll be selecting a random attend, uh, at random an attendee who will win an electronic version of the Oncology Toolkit. Good luck, everyone. At this time, I would like to introduce our presenter for today's webinar. Rowan Levine is an oncology dietitian at St. Luke's Health System, Mountain State's Tumor Institute in Idaho. Her bio can be found in the upper left corner of your screen. At this time, I will turn the session over to Ron. Thank you, Brisson. And um, I want to take a moment just to thank ACCC for its focus on oncology nutrition programs. As we know, 80% of cancer care occurs in the community cancer center. Um, I also want to take a second just to thank the nutrition panel uh, for that's uh, volunteering for ACCC and their efforts for organizing this um, series of oncology nutrition education um, events. Uh, I do have a note from Barbara Grant to be sure to check out the articles in the March ACCC Nutrition Supplement entitled Cancer Nutrition Services, which is available in print um, or online at ACCC website. For the uh, randomly selected lucky listener, um, who will receive an oncology toolkit today. Um, I just want to say thank you to the evidence-based research team at the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And the value is uh, $50, so good luck. So today um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, developing a culture of nutrition. And just wanted to kind of define that for a second. Um, thinking about uh, nutrition, our goal is to bring nutrition into the day-to-day -day activities at busy cancer centers across, uh, across the country. And I hope today that you'll be thinking about how to foster your own culture of nutrition. And uh, these other objectives that are on the slide will be, um, we'll also be covering these briefly. Some of the um, uh, some of the take-home points that I took from the March webinar, uh, which is archived on the ACCC website by Heidi Ganser and Kim Jordan, um, really uh, were valuable to me. And I just wanted to read a quote that um, Kim had shared um, from a patient. And so when we're talking about the big picture here and who uh, is impacted when we develop nutrition services, of course, the, the who is the patient. So this is the quote from a patient um, who Kim had been working with. And the patient said, it would be nice, or it, would, it would have been more humane if the doctor had let us know that nutrition services were available from the very beginning of my treatment. And I think that's really a powerful statement and um, to describe what, what's humane. And people working in oncology, I think, have that concept. So I've consistently found oncology clinicians from dietitians, oncology nurses, physicians, are some of the most passionate people on earth. So together, uh, when we're talking about building this culture of nutrition, together it's the nurses, the doctors, the clinicians, uh, the dietitians who form that safety net for the best, to, to provide the best patient experience. Part of that excellent patient experience in treatment includes nutritional care. When we talk about who can provide nutrition surveillance in a clinic, um, when we talk about who can provide nutrition intervention, um, I'm referring to beyond the dietitian. So that's 
part of this culture of nutrition. When sometimes I, I hear from people that the dietitian does that, and in reality, my goal is that all of the clinicians in my cancer center will be thinking and protecting nutrition, and that uh, we have developed a system so that at a certain point, they're making sure that they're involving the dietitian, but the dietitian alone is not the only one providing nutrition. Um, so just kind of moving ahead here, um, many cancer centers offer nutrition services on a limited basis. Many cancer centers have inconsistent access to registered dietitians who have those specialized oncology skills. In this setting, patients may experience a time delay between referral and nutrition intervention. Oftentimes, physicians and nurses refer only severely malnourished patients, uh, partially because of this uh, perceived difficulty in obtaining dietitian access. The scenario that um, I think is the cycle is what I call a, cra a cycle of crash and burn consults. And the problem or the danger in that type of a consult is that nutrition intervention is limit, has limited effectiveness. And patients don't receive early nutrition intervention, which we know that's when they receive the most benefit. That's when it protects quality of life. So over the years, um, as I've worked on developing this culture of nutrition at my centers, we're, we've moved to proactive nutrition. And the goal is here, it's all win-win. So it's a win for the doctor who understands that the patient has been well cared for. It's a win for the dietitian because the, the, the interventions are more effective. It's a win for the patient because their quality of life is, is protected. It's a win for the cancer center. So as oncology treatment over the last couple decades has, has shift, shifted from the outpatient setting, support services have changed. And with this move to outpatient, oncology patients in particular lost access to routine nutrition screening and interventions that are provided by registered dietitians in the hospital setting. So as we move from inpatient to outpatient, nutrition services were either forgotten or perhaps um, even worse. Um, Perhaps uh, the powers that be thought that nutrition wasn't important. When we look at the effect of nutrition in the cancer patient, um, what we have is a very lengthy healing of process. So even in the best situation of an early cancer diagnosis, we're talking somewhere between three to six months of healing. And more commonly, we're looking at six months to 12 months of healing process, which is a very lengthy time period um, where people can experience multiple um, barriers to their nutrition. So just thinking through um, nutrition in the cancer patient, we know, of course, um, as clinicians, we know that cancer has an impact on the, the body. Um, cancer changes the metabolism and disrupts host homeostasis. So utilization of carbohydrate is altered in terms of glucose tolerance, insulin resistance, um, increased use of the Cori cycle. If you remember your biochemistry, the Cori cycle um, is the um, uh, less efficient form of developing or utilizing carbohydrate. So we actually waste energy. So cancer cells are less efficient, and the estimated deficit in a day is about 300 calories. We have the altered util utilization of protein and depletion of lean muscle mass due to increased tumor demand, as well as um, decreased host protein synthesis. And there's an estimated about a 20% negative protein balance um, in a cancer patient, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as utilization of fats being altered. We have increased fat mobilization and breakdown, as well as um, decreased fat synthesis. And even in the setting of adequate calories, we will see uh, decreases in fatty tissue. <clears throat> excuse me. Taking a look at, and you guys are the experts here, the treatment effects on nutrition. Of course, uh, we have multiple opportunities where nutrition can be impacted. All manners of surgeries, chemotherapies, biotherapies, and radiation treatments can have impact that create barriers for nutrition. 39% of, of patients may experience nausea even prior to treatment. 46% of patients will experience taste alteration during treatment. 56% of patients will experience constipation during treatment. And 60% of patients will have fullness or early satiety. So all oncology practitioners know um, that these symptoms occur and that they change and that they reoccur. 
and that they, they may be altered. So over time, patients may experience multiple barriers to their nutrition. Thinking through prioritization of patients, um, in a community cancer setting, we can expect that somewhere between 35 to 40 percent of patients will be high risk for malnutrition. And the reason I'm pointing out the difference, a community cancer center may treat um, all forms of cancer or many forms of cancer where a specialized center may treat only certain or certain high risk cancers. So in the ca community cancer center, 35 to 40 percent will be considered high risk for malnutrition. There's data that suggests that 80 percent of the upper GI pancreatic and 60 percent of lung patients will have already experienced significant weight loss before they're even diagnosed. In addition, patients with non-small cell lung cancer, the data suggests that 77 percent are malnourished at the time of diagnosis and that 52 percent of those patients are in urgent need of nutrition intervention. On my list here, I have the diagnoses that I would consider to be high risk, which would include head and neck, esophagus, GI tract, lung, as well as co-combinant patients, uh, co-combinant treatment patients. But in addition, I have on the left, or I'm sorry, on the right, um, additional uh, situations where a patient would become a high risk patient with weight loss, with an onset of dysphagia, with the utilization of nutrition support, such as tube feeding or TPN, um, with um, side effect management, with altered lab values when they have a wound or a surgery that requires extensive healing, as well as subpopulations, for example, pediatric patients, uh, perhaps um, bone marrow transplant specialty clinics. Um, and in addition to that, we have palliative care and survivorship. So survivorship patients would oftentimes be considered low risk when we look at our prioritization. However, we know uh, and I'm just thinking ahead here, when you think about what services should be available for our patients, um, do we want to limit our services to high-risk patients? Um, in survivorship, 29% of breast cancer patients gain weight during treatment, which increases their risk for recurrence of disease. So when we look at the impact of future uh, nutrition services, should we be making sure that we have the uh, FTE or full-time equivalent that we need to provide the survivorship um, appointments so we should provide survivorship interventions. Um, I don't think for a breast cancer patient that they would consider their needs to be any less important. When reviewing the literature for incidence of interference on in nutrition, just taking a look at the data, we have 50 percent, so half of the patients will experience a decrease in appetite during treatment. Um, more than half will actually eat less many patients will become underweight and most patients, three quarters of the patients, will experience weight loss during treatment. And a weight loss of 10 kilograms is observed in about 40 to 70 percent of cancer patients. The weight loss uh, is also important. It's associated with mortality in 20 to 25 percent of cancer patients. So when we're talking about targeting um, areas or targeting uh, strategies coming up with strategies that would, that would impact the health and the well-being of cancer patients, this would be the reason that we focus so heavily on prevention of weight loss. Very briefly, just wanted to look at the impact of involuntary weight loss on, on muscle. And involuntary weight loss is catabolic in nature, and it does involve muscle loss, and it is associated with poorer outcomes. Loss of smooth muscle um, and skeletal muscle impacts all areas of life. And just taking a look here at where smooth muscle is uh, influenced, if, if we, I mean, we've all noticed that when we're caring for patients that they may have um, decreased motility. We know that at a certain point in their treatment that they experience delayed gastric emptying. We know at a certain point that they aren't going to be able to tolerate large meals. Um, we know that if they do eat large meals, that it, it may actually uh, create uh, you know, nausea or vomiting. But there are other things also that we may not really be aware of. And for example, when we're losing muscle and smooth muscle in particular, we're seeing that it affects the immune response. It affects um, hormones. It affects enzymes, including digestive enzymes. 
On this next slide, it focuses uh, more on the skeletal muscle side. And this is probably where a lot of what we would call quality of life issues come in and the dangerous complications uh, that can occur when somebody is having involuntary weight loss and losing skeletal muscle. And just for example, as a matter of fact, when I talk to a patient who is having a lot of fatigue, the very first thing I'm looking for is if they're losing weight because we can make an immediate impact, an immediate improvement in this patient's life by helping them to prevent further weight loss and thereby Im improve their fatigue levels. But just taking a look at how some of these are actually dangerous complications, including um, uh, DVT, uh, decreased wound healing, um, pulmonary edema, decreasing the ability to cough or clear secretions, increased risks for aspiration and pneumonias. So when we're referring to malnutrition, when we're referring to uh, the cancer patient population, um, and let me point out, this is news to many clinicians that malnutrition is important, that it occurs, and that it can, that there are interventions that can um, protect patients from malnutrition. Um, so, but the, the message I like to get out to clinicians is that this is a key point. This is that early intervention is the key, that patients are developing malnutrition and that, uh, that attempts to reverse severe depletion are generally unsuccessful. It's like a slippery slope. So our goal is not to fix it. And, and I want that kind of out of the mind of the doctor that we can regain weight in treatment or that we can regain the protein status. Really what all we can do is we can, we can halt it. We can hold it. So the goal is to get there early and to prevent that slippery slide down, downhill towards malnutrition. Just thinking through then um, nutritional status and treatment, um, malnutrition as a prognostic indicator, um, the data, most of the data that we have as um, a prognostic indicator comes from outside of the United States, and this is an area that we would really like to see more research in. It's, um, but looking at weight loss, looking at treatment breaks, looking at side effects, looking at recurrence of disease, we do have data that supports that malnutrition blunts response to treatment and that a weight loss of as little as 6% can predict response to therapy, um, overall survival from their cancer, productivity, and quality of life. Um, so preventing the weight loss keeps the patient on their treatment, which makes their treatment more effective. Um, there's an example in the literature on head and neck cancer treatment that a treatment break in radiation of one day can increase the, re the re risk for recurrence by 1%. So in other words, if somebody has to take a treatment break, that is not a good prognostic indicator for their control of their disease. Looking then kind of on the flip side, what does good nutrition do? Um, we know that good nutrition can decrease those complications and infections. It can decrease the impact of treatment side effects. It can speed healing. It can decrease costs associated with treatment. And again, the most important or the most significant thing in my opinion and probably in most patients' opinion is it can increase their tolerance to treatment and increase their response to treatment. And if you're a patient, you want to get as much treatment as the doctor intended for you upon diagnosis. Also important to the patient is this idea of quality of life. There's a lot of quality of life that, in, that we, through our culture, associate with food. And it's spending time with people, it's appetite, it's enjoyment. How many patients do you know who, once they've lost their sense of appetite, have, can't even imagine that there's any reason to eat? We, we have to instruct them on basic nutrition that, that they need to eat even if they're not hungry. Just taking a look again, talking about the fatigue level or strength, and so if we can protect that lean body mass, we can prevent fatigue. Um, and also just thinking in terms of performance status, and weight loss has been correlated with performance status in a majority of cancer types. Just wanted to kind of throw this out here. This is an idea that I've been really interested in recently. But the idea that patient satisfaction is rated higher with nutrition intervention. And if you're familiar with some of the hot topics out there, one of the things that's going on across the country is the introduction of this HCAPS that's coming to hospitals. And the HCAPS is an initiative to provide a standardized survey instrument to do data collection for measuring patient perspective. And the important link here is that patient satisfaction 
patient perceptions of their care at the hospital is going to be linked to reimbursement. So this process is just now starting to get rolling, and it's primarily in the inpatient setting. However, I can see where this is where we're going here. And so thinking through patient satisfaction, if we know that nutrition services um, and support services, and this is an article by Ice and Ring uh, in 2004, it was a small study, but it showed that patient perceptions and satisfaction were higher when they were receiving support services, including nutrition. There was a bigger uh, poster that uh, was by Walcott, which was in 2008 ASCO annual meeting, um, which was thousands of patients. This was a survey that was done by an insurance company that once again found that Nutrition was one of those services that was linked to higher level patient satisfaction. So this is an opportunity perhaps for us on a national uh, basis to survey patients and document that patient satisfaction uh, when they're receiving the uh, uh, nutrition services and just see if perhaps that would help to drive um, additional hours for oncology nutrition. Um, other things that are, uh, have been found, another study found that 35% of oncology patients who rece or did receive nutrition intervention in the clinic, but that 68% of the remaining patients indicated that they would have liked to have had nutrition services. So this is an angle that I think uh, regarding quality of life and patient satisfaction that may be able to drive FTE in the future. Other hot topics and, uh, that might be of interest to cancer center administrators, um, the whole survivorship movement that's moving forward, um, as well as the whole patient navigation um, requirement that's coming up. And I was really interested in the articles in the um, ACCC supplement um, that uh, was written. It was Keele Trentham at uh, Multicare Regional Cancer Center in Washington State, that her job as the oncology dietitian is actually part of the navigation team. And I, I thought that was brilliant. So malnutrition happens. Um, uh, when I first thought of this, I was going to make it into a bumper sticker. I thought it was funny. So malnutrition happens. And this crash and burn lifestyle that has become common in a cancer center um, is, is outdated. So you know, the system where everyone loses, the doctor, the patient, the dietitian, the cancer center itself, um, it's, it's uh, uh, it leads everybody to believe that nutrition didn't help or didn't make a difference. And that's the old paradigm. The old paradigm where malnutrition was an expected outcome of cancer treatment. So we want to be moving away from this old paradigm. And my question for you is, are you functioning or is your cancer center functioning underneath this old paradigm? So your question, the question is, what is your facility doing about it? The, uh, just thinking through then, this might be the opportunity to commit the time, commit the effort, commit the resources, have that conversation with your administrators, with the leadership in your facility to uh, work on catching malnutrition early and then meeting and treating the patient need. Um, just very briefly, this was actually addressed in the last webinar. Uh, that was uh, the last nutrition webinar by Kim Jordan and Heidi Ganser. And um, the nutrition screening and intervention as, as seen by uh, or as recommended by all of these different agencies. So our goal is, as cancer centers, would be to move forward and find the patients and unmask that malnutrition. I wanted to point out um, that I have a couple of, of uh, practices that I think kind of underpin excellent nutrition programs. I think this is consistent when you look at uh, the, diff the choices that different dietitians and oncology centers have made around the country uh, that you know, move oncology practice forward. And so the very first or most important one that I think is helpful to developing oncology nutrition practices is to, de or to implement some kind of malnutrition screening tool. Each one of the three that are listed here have pros and cons, and it's important for your facility to make the choice that would work best for them. But, uh, and each one of these is validated in oncology patients and is approved by the Oncology Nursing Society. Um, I wrote an article a couple years ago called Screening as the Seventh Vital Sign. And uh, the, the idea being that, uh, I, or I use that term, the seventh vital sign, because I wanted the, Im the import of nutrition to be captured in the clinic. And by describing it as a vital sign after things like oxygenation and, <laughs> and uh, blood pressure and heart rate, that, that the clinic would be looking at it as an absolutely uh, important next 
uh, piece of information to be gathering. In my clinic, um, we chose to use a version of the male nutrition screening tool, which is two data points. The patient-generated subjective global assessment, uh, which is both a screening tool and a nutrition assessment, has 17 data points. Um, the mini nutrition assessment has uh, 18 data points. So, uh, you know, it's important to evaluate which tool would work best for you. Thinking about uh, malnutrition screening, um, one of the important concepts is not just to have the tool, but to apply it routinely, consistently across all cancer treatment, which means that they don't just do it on admission, they do it perhaps each time they see the physician, um, and that, that we're monitoring the patient as they move through treatment. The interesting thing that happened at my center was that although I had that high risk list of people that we were following, based on diagnosis, we found that about another 8 to 10 percent of patients were popping up with diagnoses that I would have never thought uh, would experience malnutrition. So we captured a whole different population of people who um, were going to benefit by um, having this uh, effective nutrition care in place. So the second things uh, that I think are very important is uh, to develop a system for oncology nutrition referrals which would mean that your malnutrition screening is applied and then referred so that there is somebody in place to pick up the referral, um, as well as um, uh, thinking through um, who is able to do some, uh, or who, who is the key player who provides nutrition referrals? Who are the practitioners who really think and see and monitor patients and can be our partner, our powerful collaborative partner in malnutrition referrals. And of course, that would be our physicians and our nurses. Um, so, and just to kind of think about how, how important that is. If the, if the physician and the nurse at, a, at an oncology clinic know that they have a good resource in their dietitian, they are very powerful at, at implementing or, or developing a new, uh, a new position. And as a matter of fact, my first oncology job, um, was because of an oncology nurse. Um, her name is Diane McElwain in Pennsylvania, and um, she had the vision to insist on having an oncology dietitian as part of the team. She was very, she's an expert in nutrition uh, from the nursing perspective, but she knew that there was another aspect that would be important for patient care. Thinking also in terms of nurses um, as being an important part of uh, the this, this safety net for nutrition, um, they're in the position where they see the patients more often. They spend more time with patients. Um, they evaluate the medications and that they're being used effectively. So by incorporating in your culture of nutrition um, education and tools and resources for the oncology nurses as well as for the physicians, um, you're, you're really um, preparing your nurses to do the firefighting that, that, that they know they can do a good job and then refer to the dietitian when they need to. If I could be everywhere all the time, I would. But I'm sure most of you would ex also experience that in your cancer centers, that you just can't see everybody all the time. So the next practice that I think is really uh, consistently um, seen throughout cancer centers um, who have oncology nutrition practice is the use of the medical nutrition therapy, which is the nutrition diagnostic therapy and counseling services, which are used um, uh, for the purpose of disease management by dietitians, and it is aimed at managing symptoms, preventing weight loss, maintaining optimal nutritional status in cancer treatment. Um, and we have data that shows that use of medical nutrition therapy is effective um, and that this type of intervention does improve outcomes. The fourth practice that I think is really significant is having access to an oncology dietitian. So the oncology dietitian um, is the practitioner who has spent time developing their oncology nutrition skills. Oncology nutrition is a specialty practice. And so either there, there are ways that you can go out uh, through um, cdrnet.org and you can find an oncology dietitian or as many cancer centers um, find it's more effective to grow their own. And um, when I was chair of the Oncology Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group a couple years ago, my motto during that year was every dietitian does oncology. Just like every dietitian needs to have a good background in heart disease and in diabetes, 
management. Every dietitian does oncology, and every dietitian sees oncology patients. So even if you're on the floor for delivering babies, you will have cancer survivors that come through your, your, uh, your hands. So uh, developing the cancer skills becomes, or the oncology nutrition skills become significant. And the last thing is uh, basically what we're talking about today. So again, just kind of driving that home that nutrition is the responsibility of everyone who works in the cancer center. Um, oncology nutrition is a team effort um, because every clinician, whether it's a radiation therapist or a pharmacist or a physician, they talk with the patient, they interact with the patient, and if each one of them has it on their radar screen, if they have the background, the education, then they can monitor, they can listen, they can think, and they can act on nutrition issues and then refer to the dietitian. If it makes you feel uncomfortable that other people are helping with the nutrition, I just want you to feel confident in your skills as a practitioner that you are that you are the one that you become their resource. And there is plenty of male nutrition to go around. Don't worry. So just taking a look through the literature at different uh, opportunities, different staffing models, I found there were a couple of interesting articles out there, one of which is uh, by uh, Managing Human Resources 2010 by Laura Byham Gray, um, clinical staffing um, article, uh, it came out in 2004, um, an article, uh, Patient Nutrition Acuity and MNT Time, or MNTT as is the abbreviation. Um, there's also an article out right now uh, in the March 2012 journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics uh, entitled Future Scan, talking about the future. Um, and in her article, she reviews population changes and kind of like where to direct services where to plan services, and I think cancer centers um, have additional information they can add to that. So just for example, we know right now there are 11.7 million cancer survivors in the United States. Compare that with 1971 when there were 3 million cancer centers, or I'm sorry, 3 million cancer survivors. Um, NCI came out with data that says in 2020, we're expecting about 18 million cancer survivors. So when you think about where to put uh, FTE, perhaps cancer survivorship programs, would be the direction to go. Another uh, impact that we have right now uh, regarding staffing is accountable care and uh, becoming part or making sure that nutrition is part of that medical home concept. Um, the uh, Probably the, the biggest issue I wanted to bring up is just this idea of benchmarking. And some practices, some nutrition practices have worked on benchmarking, which basically means it gives you a clue of how many patients is appropriate per dietitian. And it would give you, and, and that's actually the number one question I get from cancer center administrators is how many dietitians should they have? How many FTE should there be to provide the services that need to be provided at a cancer center? And right now we do not have that information. So um, certain cancer centers have gone, or facilities have gone and developed their own sort of benchmarking, including things like scope of practice, use of MNT, standards of care, developing in their own, this is a physician tech, uh, terminology, but the RVU, which is basically unit constant task. So they've learned to kind of like uh, identify how much a patient, how much time a patient needs if they're this type of uh, um, service. Um, but really, it, benchmarking becomes a crucial next step to identify um, and to move the oncology nutrition practice forward. Um, so just to kind of keep that in your mind as, as uh, we are looking for resources to help us to develop that benchmarking for oncology nutrition. So um, developing systems. Just wanted to take a look at um, different systems in the um, these are just examples that, uh, the collective examples in the literature, just wanted to share that with you. Um, and then uh, just kind of, I, I wanted to just give some examples of turning numbers and data into FTE. Karen Grogan and Jeffrey Wittridge at Mission Hospital in Asheville, North Carolina, in their article um, in the uh, ACCC supplement, uh, did a needs assessment that showed that 63% of their radiation patients were at risk for malnutrition before they even started treatment, and used that data to shape the scope of their oncology nutrition program. Numbers speak to the business side of healthcare. Numbers create buy-in from your administrators. 
So when you say as a clinician, I'm too busy, that is not the same thing as saying 50% of the cancer center patients are not getting seen. So turning your patient care numbers uh, into data. And so I like to point out that, and this is my own personal thing, but I do not collect anybody's data for them unless I can turn it somehow into information that I would like to utilize. So my rule of thumb is if I collect data for somebody else, I add something to it that will be useful for me. For example, if they want to know how many patients are referred to the oncology dietitian and I have to keep track of that for people, what I do is I add another column and I'll keep track of who referred it so I can go back to them later on and say, well, 20% of your referrals are from the surgeons, 70% of your referrals are from the radiation oncologist because that's useful data. Um, if I have to collect numbers of patients, I can keep track of how long did it take me from the time I got the referral until I was able to see that patient. Is it acceptable that a patient waits one week? Is it acceptable that a patient waits two weeks? Is it acceptable? I mean, we could go on and on. Um, another thing I like to keep track of is how many are high risk according to our strategies. Or, and, you know, just if it's a high risk patient, if it's not a high risk patient. So, on the left-hand side of the slide, I have performance improvement ideas and, for example, you know, asking quality of life type information. Did the patient feel they benefited from the nutrition services? Um, would they have liked to have seen the dietitian while in treatment? On the right-hand side of the slide, I've included a whole different concept. So, so often when we're doing performance improvement, we focus on what we have done. What I want to do is I want to capture all the stuff that we didn't do, that we didn't have time to do. And for example, how many days did the patient wait? How many patients were not seen at all? How many patients were seen late? How many patients, or how many additional visits would there have been if the patient had not been seen late? So in other words, if it took me three months to get back to a patient on a follow-up, um, if I had seen them more appropriately, perhaps I would have seen them every month, they would have been seen three times in a three-month period of time. Another thing I like to capture is how many have received a suboptimal visit, for example, a chart review versus an actual contact. Um, how many, you can estimate how many services are not even offered. Nutrition services are kind of like an onion, <laughs> and so there are different layers of services. This is not intuitive. We know what else we could be offering. We know what other nutrition centers are offering. Your, your administrators may have no idea what else is not even being offered. Uh, considered at this point. And then lastly, consider powerful data collection on, um, on services that have been held off or have saved money. So for example, every IV hydration that a patient does not have to go through potentially can uh, create a situation where a patient it saved the hospital $200. This is just an example of a performance improvement that I had done which captures, these are actually patients that were screened as having a malnutrition risk, and this is the number of consults that I was able to complete in an appropriate time frame. So technically, I was seeing about half of the patients in an appropriate time frame. So that's very useful information. If I keep it to myself, it doesn't do me any good and it doesn't do the patient any good. So I'm sharing that information upward. Uh, just kind of changing gears here, wanted to talk briefly about tools and resources to help develop that nutrition, oncology nutrition skill set. So um, oftentimes as an oncology dietitian, we work uh, by ourselves, we specialize by ourselves, um, we may be the very first practitioner um, to be providing oncology nutrition services. And I just wanted you to be aware that the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has some very strong resources, very helpful resources, including the Evidence Analysis Library Oncology section. I'm gonna show you some slides from that. The Oncology Nutrition Toolkit. Um, the journal has the article, we're gonna talk about this just very briefly, the standards of practice, um, as well as the Commission on Dietetic Registration Specialty Practice Exam and preparations for that for the, um, for the Certified Specialist Oncology Board Exam. On the right-hand side here, I have the uh, resources that are through the Oncology Nutrition Practice Group. And I wanna point out that um, uh, that not only is there a website, but also the newsletter and the listserv. And when I was a new practitioner, the listserv saved my life multiple times. There also are uh, new versions of the what has been called the clinical guide. I believe the new name is going to be the Clinical Nutrition for Oncology Practice for a new resource material that's upcoming. 
um, as well as the complete resource kit for oncology nutrition is going to be coming out shortly. In addition to the academy resources, there's also Oncology Nursing Society, which has patient and nutrition resources, um, which has um, uh, other tools that cross over from nursing or uh, into nutrition and uh, can be used by many disciplines. Just very briefly, I wanted to walk you through some of the questions that are on the evidence analysis library. This is at eatright.org. And um, just to take a look, um, this, uh, by the way, the EAL oncology section is under revision, and that project is being led by Laura Elliott. Um, but just taking a look at the multiple um, questions where this can make you the expert. Um, an additional slide here, these are, um, if you take a look at the questions, it's things like, does medical nutrition therapy provided by a nutrition professional, uh, is it effective in adult patients receiving radiation? So these are the kind of answers that may assist your career. Just very briefly, I wanted to look at the Oncology Toolkit, uh, which was published in 2010. It was a great effort between Diane Kiyamoto and Laura Elliott. Um, and uh, this uh, document, it's actually 42 documents, 300 pages, and um, it's available in print as well as in an electronic format. And it has um, medical nutrition therapy summaries, um, recommendations for different cancer types. This is just the table of contents. Um, as well as progress note documentation forms, case studies, patient education lists, resource lists, library recommendations, outcomes monitoring forms, survivorship care plans, as well as standardized language uh, implementation. So just to show you kind of a couple of, this is the topic on fluid intake, and as you can see it has, um, it gives counseling suggestions and ideas to make sure that you've thought through everything, as well as um, the resources that might go along with this. Um, and just if you look, they have uh, have what we call pearls, and um, I just it's an extensive, uh, comprehensive document and gives you specific um, tools that really give you the oncology perspective. I just briefly wanted to uh, draw your attention to the um, standards of practice and standards of professional performance, and that name is so cumbersome. And nobody knows what that really means, that it has a nickname, and we call it the S-O-P-S-O-P-P. -P. And uh, this is an article that was led by Kim Rabin, and this, it's, a, it's a lengthy document. And what I wanted to show you is that kind of hidden within the document is a chart. And it is a sort, it's sort of like a checklist, and, um, which can be used as a self-assessment to identify areas of practice and to really help clinicians target what uh, education needs they have um, that would assist them in their oncology practice. In addition, I'd like to kind of, if you look on the right-hand side, um, there's a, a, where the X's are, they have a column for generalist specialty in advance. And as you can see, um, when we, uh, have a topic, determines client focus goals and expected outcomes. Uh, there are, is a skill that the generalist would be expected to have, but as you move into your practice, the, the uh, specialist actually has a little bit different skill in anticipating acute or delayed um, side effects of treatment. So these are skills then that you can kind of put on your radar screen that this is something that you want to be learning more about. And um, on this the last slide here, I wanted to just point out that once again, here we have uh, generalists are expected to be able to do a certain aspect, but specialists are a certain aspect and, and advanced or even more, uh, I guess, more further um, uh, specialized and, uh, in, in their abilities. So just something, we're all on this grid somewhere, and the goal is just to kind of, I think the goal was to be the most effective and be able to update your skills as quickly as possible. And it's, when you're learning a new practice, you don't even know what you don't know. Very briefly, just wanted to talk about um, the CSO and uh, their, uh, this is an examination, a board certification exam that came out um, after 2008. And it is, uh, it requires at least two years of uh, dietetic practice as well as 2,000 hours of oncology related experiences in a five year period of time. It is a recertification exam every five years um, and it denotes the RD that possesses special knowledge, 
um, competency and experience in oncology nutrition. And I just want to say that when we uh, were able to uh, have this exam developed, it was one of the proudest moments I think I've ever, uh, that I had working with the DPG. So just very quickly talking about the Oncology Nutrition DPG, I also I want to point out this is a, one, a screenshot off of uh, the website, that this is one of the best resources for Oncology Nutrition hot topics. So if you're looking to keep up to date, if you want to be the expert in your clinic, if you want to, um, you know, be working, um, developing, addition, mentoring other people, this would be a great resource. Um, included in your membership also is access to the Nat Natural Medicine Comprehensive Database, which I think is like $90 if you subscribe on your own. So this is a great resource, um, which includes other benefits. Um, another thing I wanted to point out about the DPG is that this is a great way to share practice very rapidly. So if you have a, a good idea, if you've had a great experience, this is a great tool to get your information out with other, to other RDs. Um, the Oncology Nutrition Connection, which is a publication, I just want to point out that most of our articles are written by oncology dietitians. Uh, we do have mentors for helping people to develop their writing skills. And once again, it's an excellent way to share practice and to just make sure you aren't missing anything. Um, this is our last newsletter. I just wanted to point out some of the topics here. Head and neck cancer, defining effective medical nutrition therapy for uh, nutritional phases during chemo radiation, and tips for enteral administration of medication. So these are all very relevant practice tools. Just very briefly, when we talk about cancer prevention and cancer survivorship, the gold standard is really the AICR, American Institute for Cancer Research um, materials. These are all avail available online. And um, in addition to the actual report, which came to the expert report, which came out in 2007, we also have the continuous updates. And so we had the breast update in 2010 and the colorectal update in 2011. So in other words, not only did they review all the evidence when they put out the report, but they also are keeping up with the evidence. So when you go before the physician, when you go before the nurse, when you go before the patient, you can be very confident that you know what you're talking about as far as disease prevention. Um, just wanted to show that this is a tool that I use a lot of times either with like clinicians like nurses, physicians, or even with patients sometimes to get them to focus on what we know. And this is just a pictorial demonstration. They evaluate 17 cancer types, 45 different specific nutrients or foods, and it just puts it into a really nice perspective, the blue being protective against a particular cancer type, the red or the pink being a, uh, something that would encourage the cancer. And the real important uh, concept here is that I don't want people to waste their time. So if they're focusing on, um, you know, I don't know, taking a supplement versus reducing the fat in their diet, um, you know, this is a way for me to help to target their, their skills or their, their time and their effort. So just uh, kind of moving along, just thinking at the, kind of wrapping this up about your cancer center. So developing the culture. Um, find a champion, find lots of champions actually, and I do want to point out that you might be the champion. Um, but your champions, like in your administration, your physicians, your nursing, your nutrition department, um, they may help you to obtain resources, they may add you into strategic plans, they may be able to provide you introductions, they may be able to help you to navigate the system to be more effective. I want you to, um, thinking about joining the decision makers at events, volunteer at events, um, just recently, I volunteered at a children's hospital um, event and ended up in the e-news that like comes out to all the different facilities. Um, you know, and it just it created dialogue. People are like, "Oh, look, you know, the dietitian really cares." If you have a relay for life, get involved in the relay for life because most of your nurses are going to be involved in that at your cancer center. Be part of the team. Um, regarding joining the decision makers, offer reports. Your cancer committee would love to have a report on what practices you are using in your, in your nutrition and also what you might be interested in doing down the road. Um, additionally, I want to just bring up that um, mentoring others. We've all had the experience where a clinician, a physician, a nurse, somebody is giving outdated information to a patient. We've had the experience where perhaps they're giving inaccurate information. We've also had the experience where they're giving out plain, crazy information. So don't get mad, don't get annoyed, get busy. 
this is your opportunity. You're the expert. Be the leader. Be the resource to enhance the practice at your clinic. And it's not just for the patient that they already talked to, but it's for the patient down the hall that they're heading in to see next. Just very quickly, um, a lot of us in um, the sciences don't have um, education or backgrounds to prepare us to um, to motivate other people to be sort of to do a sales pitch kind of thing. So I just wanted to briefly talk about this. This is actually a great. Uh, this is something that I would ask you to be um, working towards, and maybe even get some information about how to market. Now, I'm not asking you to market anything but yourself marketing your services, but you want to be able to grab their attention, you want to be memorable, you want to generate a response, you want to show your passion. Um, so just thinking about this thing, it's called an elevator speech, it just means you prepare two to three minutes and that you have something ready to go. I just happened to have a couple, this is about two years ago, I was working down in the um, in the cancer center with my back to the door and just happened to have one of the vice presidents of the hospital walk in just kind of doing a tour around and I thought to myself, boy, I got, I got some news for you. So I had my two minute speech ready to go and um, they probably didn't know what hit them. But be, be the expert, be prepared to talk to people in a succinct manner about what you have accomplished and what you would like to see next. Remember, this is not intuitive. They have no idea what else we could be offering. Just thinking very quickly about a motivational factor, there's about 50 different marketing recommendations. I just pulled some that are appropriate for the healthcare setting. But um, these are things that you can kind of tailor messages around. For example, association, um, using other facilities, what other facilities are doing. Um, if you have a, uh, on the band, getting people to jump on the bandwagon, if you have a, um, if you have a competitor in your area, perhaps you can talk about the services that they're offering and that you would like to offer too. Um, fear, it doesn't sound very pleasant, but it's important to talk to them about, okay, this is the number of patients that are not being seen. Here's the number of patients that have triggered for malnutrition. I mean, those are important motivators for administration when you're trying to develop services. Um, I use a lot of humor, but it's, I have to be very careful with the timing. Um, charisma, there is nothing more charismatic than people speaking the truth and people who are passionate about, about what they care about. So if you are uh, involved in your, taking care of your patients and you know what you can do for your patients, that, that speaks volumes. Um, another really powerful marketing tool is new or only, and um, that's a great way to um, bring something up. Let's do a new service. We'll be the only one with that service in the area. Um, our cancer center would be different because of the service. Um, and then on the right-hand side of the slide, I have just like um, the idea that by knowing who your audience is and knowing yourself, like your style is very helpful and you need to prepare accordingly. So just very quickly, if you are in the late majority or a traditionalist in your thinking, then maybe um, your goal is to uh, talk about, um, uh, you know, the, uh, I have expert knowledge. Um, these are things that would be um, every other facility is already doing. If, you're, if the person you're talking to is an innovator or an early adopter, then definitely go the direction of new or only or bandwagon. Um, if your facilitator, I'm sorry, if your a facility administrator is like a late majority or traditionalist, then talking about the bandwagon, everybody else is doing this, we need to do this too as a way to kind of motivate them. Um, I wanted to just very briefly talk about the concept of talking up. That's actually, our facility is uh, talking up about the facility. So, for example, to make patients feel more comfortable, you know, you talk about, oh, well, this, our food, we have the best food in the area. Um, but there's also, you can do that for your own services. And so, for example, when I meet new doctors in my facility, I, I say, I'm going to make your job easier. Um, when I am talking to a patient and they say, I'm not going to use that tube, um, I think about that for a second and then I'll say, you know what, I, if you don't want to use that tube, I am now your new best friend. Um, if you have a nurse that is framing things in the way that if you lose weight, I'm going to call the dietitian, sort of like being sent to the principal, it would be appropriate to talk to that nurse and just say, look, you know, we want them to feel good about seeing the dietitian. So, um, you know, framing it in a way that would be a positive way of saying it, talking up. The rest of these slides I've included mostly for you just as review. I'm not really going to go through all of these. Some of these have been included in previous slides. 
But I just wanted to, I came out with, by looking through the different uh, resources that are shared, um, I came out with 30 different kind of common uh, practices that are being done around the country in cancer centers, and I thought you could kind of look through this and kind of just be aware of what other cancer centers are doing. Maybe it would be um, an idea that you would be able to foster. Um, on this slide, I just wanted to talk very quickly about the future. And in particular, this is from the EAL project, is that we found that if your facility is participating in nutrition research, I really want to encourage you to make sure that the, the, the words registered dietitian, if you were involved at all in the, uh, in the study or in the education of patients, that registered dietitian is captured and that the, if you're using medical nutrition therapy is captured because those two things have been missing in the evidence. And so when other people are writing up, they're calling us things like clinical nutrition, which might be your department, but that's not your uh, your job, uh, or it's not your uh, profession. So we want to make sure that those are captured. Um, also, I want to point out that if you have a chance to fund or participate in an oncology staffing pattern survey or nutrition benchmarking, please do. And then lastly, um, anything that you find that improves oncology nutrition reimbursement, please share with others. The Oncology Nutrition Practice Group is always available to, uh, to help, uh, help you share that information. So I just want to encourage you, be proud that you are the nutrition expert, you are the nutrition resource, but continue on your skills. Be ready, be better for what's coming down the road. I just want to uh, remind you that when you're, all the talk in facilities right now is about cost containment and decreasing costs. There are at least 10 different ways that an oncology dietitian saves money for the clinic. So using this information to share with your uh, facilitators is a significant practice. And then also be uh, you know, proud that you are a resource to the oncology patient because we know, we know and the patients know what we do and what a difference it can make. All right, um, so we have the uh, answer to the uh, polling question. And the first question that I had asked is, uh, do you think your oncology nutrition services are adequately staffed to take care of? And then I had three different choices. The nutritional needs of only high-risk patients, and 57.89% um, of the uh, respondents noted that they feel they have adequate time to take care of only the high-risk patients. Uh, the second part of that question, the nutritional needs of most patients, 33% said that they had the ability to take care of the needs of most patients. So that would be, I'm just using, so about 90% of people think that they have at least moderate ability to take care of patients. And then the nutritional needs of all patients, about 10.53% so that they have the ability to take care of all patients. Um, the follow-up part of that question was, has limited oncology nutrition staffing prevented you from suggesting or developing additional services? What I was trying to get at here was, do you feel like you hold back because you don't think you're going to have adequate time? I've heard that from many dietitians that they feel that they would be willing to offer additional services if they could be guaranteed that they'd have that time to do, uh, to, to, uh, to do that work. So 78% of the dietitians who responded here said yes. They do feel that uh, limited staffing prevents them from even offering additional services. So um, that was kind of what I was getting at with those questions, is that I feel like we, as a profession, feel as though we um, are limiting only the, the outer part of that, that onion, as I called it earlier, um, and that really there are many layers of oncology nutrition service that may be a great benefit to patients. And um, just drawing back to the talk, for example, the survivorship issue. So in the future, we see that there's going to be a huge 18 million uh, on, or cancer survivors out there. And uh, at this point, with the staffing, the way staffing is, um, our, uh, our profession is holding back. So that was just something I was interested in. So just lastly, um, I wanted to just 
uh, encourage you uh, to be active. I want you to, if your facility is not supportive in you, network with agencies who do share your passion for oncology patients. And this includes your local, your national dietetic associations, as well as ACCC, um, AICR, who has a webinar coming out on May 15th on uh, cancer prevention, um, Komen, Aspen, um, Livestrong, all of these are, are great services. And um, so after that, I just, again, I want to thank um, ACCC for this opportunity today. Thank you very much. At this time, we would take a few minutes to answer a couple of questions. A number of patients will state their concern about eating sugar. They have a fear that consumed sugar would drive their cancer to grow. Please set the record straight. What is the best advice to give a patient who has a concern? Well, that's a very common question that we hear from oncology patients. And there is a lot of misinformation that's available on the Internet, so it's a very confusing topic. Um, the issue being that in certain types of situ cancer situations, um, before a cancer is treated, there are some links to um, a white flour, white sugar kind of diet in a pre-diabetic kind of patient. So in a hormonally fed cancer, potentially if somebody is pre-diabetic and their insulin is fluctuating up and down and all around, they may be expressing growth hormone. However, once a patient is in treatment, the most effective form of, of treatment is being administered and a patient has no carbohydrate restrictions unless it's in terms of diabetes management. And actually this is consistent with ACS as well as um, NCI. So those uh, a uh, very common question, but cancer patients do not need to be concerned about avoiding sugar. Great. Now, the second question is, um, can you share ideas that work to help prevent weight loss? What can people eat when, they're, when they aren't hungry? What is working to help prevent weight loss? So, because early satiety as well as anorexia is a very common side effect of cancer and cancer treatment, um, the strategies that we use with medical nutrition therapy to help patients to eat even when they aren't hungry is to, uh, first of all, recognize that they need their nourishment to keep their strength up, then to plan or to schedule themselves to be eating very often throughout the day, perhaps every um, even every half hour to every two hours throughout the day so that they're eating because it's time to eat, not because they feel like eating. And then choosing foods that are easy to eat. So generally soft, moist food um, is something that will go down uh, easier. And if last of all, if they're unable to eat very much, then they should be drinking their calories. Okay. Okay. And third question, are community hospital nutritionists also working with patients who gain weight? Um, such as breast cancer patients on hormonal therapy uh, to discuss diet and exercise programs. Many of our patients are requesting these services. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this is part of the survivorship movement that I was talking about. Um, so it is appropriate for these patients to have services. Um, cancer centers around the country right now are struggling with a large number of patients who should be receiving um, healthy education, about just healthy diet, healthy lifestyle. So thinking about that in terms of general nutrition, it is possible that other practitioners can be included in, in helping to teach these patients. For example, nurses could be educated to provide healthy basic education as far as a good nutrition, um, weight control education, that type of thing. Um, another way of dealing with this is to develop classes or programs where multiple patients will come together. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, many cancer centers nowadays have uh, weight control classes or have resources to be able to, uh, to kind of put those patients together into a group. For those questions not answered, we will put together an FAQ and post on the nutrition website. Before we conclude today's session, I want to remind you to visit the nutrition website for more information on upcoming webinars and podcasts. Finally, please complete the evaluation in order to obtain continuing education credits. An email containing information on how to access your certificate will be emailed to attendees shortly after this webinar. This concludes the webinar. Thank you all so much for attending, and I hope that this webinar has been beneficial to you and your center.